I think um, a lot of how I think about race and also what drives what I do as a photographer has to do with how I grew up. This is my family. Which one do you think is me? <laughs> a lot of people think it's uh, actually this guy. That's my father. <laughs> but people say that I look like my father. That's me with my hand in my pocket. Uh, it seems like every family photograph I have of me growing up with my family, my sister and my brother, uh, they always had really big, nice smiles. In fact, my brother actually won a smiling contest. <laughs> he got a big trophy for how well he smiled. And I always had the same sort of bewildered expression on my face, like, <laughs> what am I doing here? There's me with the same expression. This is in front of uh, my elementary school. We were the only Asian family in our neighborhood. I am the youngest in my family. Everyone in my family was born in China, same small village in China. I was born and raised in Duluth, Minnesota. I am a native Minnesotan. So, but when I was going to school, I was the only Asian student in my class. There is my first grade class picture. Can you pick me out? <laughs> Do you see me? Does everyone see me? There I am. Do I look like I stick out? What, what do you think? Do I look like I stick out? I hear, yeah, no, maybe. I kind of people shaking their heads, not sure. I think that's a very loaded question. I think that's a very complicated question. In a way, I've been trying to answer that question for over, over 35 years with my photographs, trying to understand when do we stick out, when do we fit in, and who gets to say? Do you get to say whether you stick out or not? Do the people around you? Or how much does society shape the ideas of who we are? So I grew up wanting to be a, a writer. Got to the University of Minnesota, entered into the journalism program, trained to be a newspaper reporter. But when I was a sophomore, bought my first camera, took a trip, took some very ordinary photographs on this trip, and decided I wanted to become a photographer. So I thought, well, I'll get my journalism degree, teach myself photography, and become a freelance journalist, which is what I ended up doing. My first published story was on my father, Joe Huey. My father came to this country, 19 years old, didn't speak much English, not much of an education. What kind of future did he have? What kind of chance did he have for any part of the American dream? Well, like many immigrants, he realized he worked hard, learned English, anything's possible. And especially for Chinese immigrants at the time, he realized he could always open a Chinese restaurant, which is what he ended up doing. Worked 16 hours a day, washing dishes, worked his way as a cook, manager, went to school for one hour a day uh, to learn English, and eventually opened up his own restaurant. By the time I took this photograph, everyone in Duluth, Minnesota, knew about my father's restaurant, Joe Huey's Cafe. But I didn't know my father very well, because he worked every single day. 365 days a week, a uh, year, and 12, 12 hours a day. And never once took me to a ball game, to the park. His concern was about family survival. So I thought, I'm going to do a story of my father. And it was interesting because I never really, there are a lot of secrets in my family. How many people feel like there are secrets in your family? Yeah, it's probably true for most families, but particularly true for immigrant families because I didn't realize until I was a teenager that my father immigrated illegally. My family, we had a different name growing up. My name growing up, our name was G-E-E -E growing up. But when I was a teenager, there was an amnesty. We were, we were fortunate. We were allowed to change our name back to our real name, Huey. This, this would not happen today. So I thought it'd be interesting to ask my father questions, to give myself permission to ask him questions, not as a son, but as a reporter. Got to know a lot about my father I didn't know just by asking questions. And then looking, photographing my father, I felt like I never really looked at him. I mean, how many of us become so familiar with those closest to us 
that we don't really see them anymore. We don't really look at them. So in a way, when I took this photograph of my father, really scrutinized him through the camera lens in the kitchen, in the house that I grew up in, this was over 35 years ago. I felt I was really seeing him for the first time. Since then, I have photographed thousands of people. Almost all of the people that I photograph are strangers. But in a way, the experience has been like photographing my father. Whether I'm photographing something familiar or unfamiliar, I try to see it in a new way. I try to see it in a photographic way. My first project was in Frogtown. I was drawn to a diverse neighborhood. I moved from Duluth to the Twin Cities after graduating. Moved back to Duluth for a while. And as I said, where I grew up was not very diverse. Every room that I was in, if there was another Asian person in it, I was probably related to them. <laughs> but moving down to the Twin Cities, I wanted to understand this kind of diversity. So my first project was in Frogtown. Now, I would just walk up and down the street with my camera gear and approach you, say I approach you, complete stranger. And I would say, I am a professional photographer. I am doing a community photography project on your neighborhood. Can I take your picture? We're going to, ha we're going to have a community exhibit. A lot of probably people, if I walked up to them, complete strangers, say, yeah, go ahead, take my picture. <laughs> I don't see too many hands. A lot of people say no, but a lot of people say yes. Every once in a while, someone will call the police. <laughs> but a lot of people say yes. And then I would say, you know, I'm not looking for posed pictures. Just do what you're doing. I'm just going to hang out with you. How many snakes do you see there? Four. If you're walking down the street, you see these guys with their Burma pythons, how many people would go, I'm walking on the other side of the street? <laughs> All right. How many people would go, cool, snakes, I'm going to talk to those guys? OK. Well, I'm just like most people. I have my own biases, the, the, my own things that make me feel uncomfortable. But I'm better able to put that aside when I got a camera around my neck. Better able to get outside my own personal, cultural bubble. And I'm always confronted by what was in my head and then actually meeting someone and talking to them. This family I photographed, I probably took about 50 photographs. It wasn't until this young woman raised the baby that everything fell into place. This pyramid of bodies, triangles everywhere, echoed in their surroundings. I think it's difficult to come up with a photograph where everything works, where if you, if you feel like you move one little thing, it would fall apart. So close that they form like a heart, like two halves of a heart. Even on her shirt is a heart. I was photographing in front of these houses, and there were neighbors from different houses just hanging out, talking. I was photographing for this for about 20 minutes, turned around and saw this. It's like a circle of life. Maybe we come into the life the same way we leave it. We need to be in a chair with the wheels. <laughs> Are they more alike or, 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 or different? Which one's grumpier? <laughs> Often when I'm giving a lecture, I ask people, what do you see, and get into a dialogue. Well, it's a little bit too many people here, but I like for you to have a conversation with the person next to you. What do you see in this next photograph? And I really believe there's no right or wrong answer. But it's useful to understand what your point of view is, how does it differ from other people, and then to consider how is your point of view formed? How much does it have to do with the countless number of images that you've consumed, that we've consumed in our lifetime? Hollywood, TV, the media, advertising, the internet, and how much of how we think of each other and ourselves has to do with direct interaction, talking to people in your community, in your schools, in your workplace on a regular basis. One minute, what do you see? 
have a conversation with your, the person next to you. What details do you see? Does a story form in your mind? What meanings does it have? Okay, so generally, I try to have a dialogue, but there's too many people here. But um, for me, everything revolves around this tree. It's like a merry-go-round. We have a black, black and white car, black and white bicycle, black and white shoes, the boys' pants, the zubas, <laughs> are like the bark on the tree, the play of light and shadow. Now, obviously, they're having a, a, a really nice moment. They're not just friends or even best friends. They're so close, it's like they're looking to a mirror. Even the way their bodies, they mirror each other. Even the way they hold their hands are the same. Again, I don't believe there's any right or wrong interpretation of a photograph. But for me, this photograph suggests a, a question central in our society, which is, when are we different when are we the same? To these two boys, does it matter? Probably not. Does it matter to society? Oh, yeah. How much does this friendship will inform how they think of the people around them and themselves? I had an exhibition in Frogtown. Never seen an exhibition outdoors. This was 1995. I decided to use my first solo exhibition, I decided to put the photographs in Frogtown. They look like, it's looked like glass, but they're just shrink wrapped, just using a, 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 a product you can get from any hardware store, the kind you use your, your windows with a blow dryer. I thought I would put it up for a month, 173 photographs. When I told people what I was going to do, people said to me, oh, that's a dumb idea. That's stupid. That's Frogtown. That's going to be vandalized. That's going to be torn down the next day. But it was up, up for a month, 24-7. It brought thousands of people because there's so much media publicity because of the unusual nature of the exhibit. And people from the neighborhoods came to the, to the exhibit and then people from outside of the neighborhood who normally would never come to a place because they were afraid to. How much does the media drive the reputation of who we are? Cover my book. When I suggested this photograph of this young man getting his hair cut, a couple of people in the department said, you can't put that on the cover. I said, really, why not? He said, well, it's kind of scary. Really, what's so scary about it? Well, it looks like someone being tortured. You know, the Vietnam War wasn't that long ago. I said, well, you know, the Vietnam War was over 30 years ago. <laughs> are you saying all of those images, this is how powerful photographs are. All of those images coming back from Vietnam, Walter Cronkite, CBS News, Time Magazine, Life Magazine, 30 years later, this is the filter through which you see this photograph. You think Viet Cong. Well, every war we're in, all of the images come back from the battlefield, shaping how we think of the enemy. How do you think America, how do you think you've been shaped by all of the images coming back from Iraq and, and Afghanistan? What does America think of Muslims? Again, who gets to decide who sticks out? Do you? Do the people around you, or how much do photographs, popular culture, shape how we think of ourselves and each other? Also photographed in small towns throughout Minnesota. A lot of how people think about Minnesota has to do with small towns. The small towns are really starting to look like Frogtown. The gap between who we are as Minnesotans and the perceptions is great. Again, who gets to say who is a Minnesotan? Am I a typical Minnesotan? You betcha. <laughs> I, started, I decided to do a larger project. Instead of one neighborhood, photograph the many neighborhoods connected by Lake Street. Lake Street, as you know, one of the most well-known streets in the Twin Cities, connects the wealthiest areas with the poorest. Everything and everything in between, everything that urban living is about can be found on Lake Street. Families that live there for many generations, immigrants from all over the, the world. My, Lake Street is a microcosm of who we are. 
I spent four years on this project. Again, what do you see? One minute. Talk to your neighbor about what you see in this photograph. Okay. I showed this in a high school a couple weeks ago. I asked the students, it's a very diverse class, what do you see in this photograph? Student right away, that guy's up to no good. <laughs> so what guy? That guy, right there. Why do you think he's up to no good? Well, you know, he's got the black leather jacket on, he's smoking a cigarette, he's got his hands in his pockets, he looks kind of sketchy. I think he's gonna grab that purse. I asked how many people think that in this class. Half the people raised their hand. I asked the other half, what do you think? One person said, well, it looks like they're waiting for a bus. Another person said, um, I don't think it's even clear they can see around the corner. Another person said, I think he's lonely. I think they're avoiding him. Another person said, well, I think it uh, shows the division in our society. That's a very good answer. Lucky for me that the society <laughs> is written on the side of the wall. <laughs> Another person, you could tell he was a little upset. He says, how do you know those little white ladies aren't going to rob him? <laughs> I said, we have so many different points of view here. Who do you, who do you think is right? One person says, um, Nobody, nobody's right. We don't know. It's just a photograph. That's true. But how you look at this photograph shows you how you look at life. Then I asked how many people thought maybe he's up to no good and then thought that's probably no good, not a good way to think. More people raised their hand. So again, how much of how you think about this photograph, how you think about yourself, the people around you, has to do with images? Hollywood. How many Hollywood movies have you seen where the African-American man is the hero? And let's not include Will Smith. <laughs> How many movies have you seen where the African-American man is a bad guy? Too many to count. Or if it's a scary movie, he gets killed off in the first reel. <laughs> or at best, he's the sidekick, the best friend. It's not hard to understand why half this class would think what they think. Well, how many movies have you seen where the Asian guy is the hero? and it's not a kung fu movie. <laughs> How many movies have you seen where the Asian guy is the geek, the nerd, never gets the girl? Pretty much all of them. <laughs> or the naked guy who jumps out of a trunk. <laughs> Hangover one, two, and three. Probably the most well-known Asian character in a recent Hollywood movie. What does that tell you about what America thinks about Asian men? Therefore, what would you think, what would you assume of me? When I ask students that, this, they would say, oh, you look like you're probably pretty good at video games. <laughs> you're kind of shy, good at math. <laughs> How am I at basketball? You're not very good. <laughs> Thank God for Jeremy Lin. So, are you aware, are we aware of our subconscious? I am just like anyone. I have my own, my own deeply embedded biases, assumptions. But when I'm out in the world, when I have a camera around my neck, I'm better able to challenge those assumptions. I'm not that friendly. In my private life, I wouldn't approach thousands of people, but this is what I do as a photographer. How can you make your subconscious, how can you be aware of your subconscious, how can you make your subconscious conscious, and how can you turn your consciousness into action?
How do images form us? Photographing him while he's drawing me. What do you think? <laughs> After four years of photographing on Lake Street, had an outdoor exhibition, uh, placed hundreds of photographs, close to 700 photographs up and down Lake Street. The one on the left is mine. How much of how you think about the world has to do with this, and how much of it has to do with this? The largest photographs. We didn't put any uh, explanations or didactics about this exhibit, just the words of the people in the photographs, talking about their lives in this six-mile exhibition. So it was up to viewers to decide for themselves what it is that they were looking at. I remember one person who thought it was a memorial service for all the people who died on Lake Street. <laughs> Another person thought it was a memorial service for the photographer who died. <laughs> Another person thought it was a Nike campaign. We put notebooks in the different coffee shops along Lake Street, invited people to write their comments. Here's what one person wrote who didn't sign their name. I still don't know who this person is. We put the words on the back of the book. Where art is not afraid to look into the eyes of us, regular poor folks, just living our lives. This art comes down from the pretentious, self-conscious, and exclusive upper-class realm. It becomes community art, art with a purpose, humane. These are the pictures you'll never see in Nike ads, or car ads, or perfume ads. These are the majority of Americans picking up their broken identities and trying to scrape together a living, a culture, an identity, a life. Most of the images we see are of advertisements trying to sell us euphoria and prestige we could never achieve. We look around us and are disappointed. We struggle but don't measure up. These photos show us real and valuable just as we are. They are sad because they aren't the perfect images of others we're used to seeing. They are empowering for the same reason. Thanks for these images and a chance to respond. Peace. <laughs> 10 years later, I did a lot of projects in between, but 10 years later, I did another project along University Avenue. Spent four years photographing everyday life along University Avenue. <laughs> and then I had a six mile exhibition again of photographs in windows, this time in color. The largest photographs, this was on the Rondo Library, still up, 20 by 30 foot photograph. Unusual to see photographs so large that aren't an advertisement trying to sell you something. There's a close-up of that photograph. And, but in this exhibit, what was different is, in here we have a music store with our cultural icons, Bruce Springsteen, Johnny Cash, and Prince, and then my photograph of a man holding a chalkboard that says lunch. I decided to give people chalkboards because I felt that when I photographed someone in the past, no matter how good the photograph is, you can't see inside the person. So how do you get a sense of what's underneath? I thought, I'll just give people chalkboards, come up with a series of questions. I may look white, but there's more to me than meets the eye. The question I asked was, how do you think other people see you, and then what don't they see? What she really said to me was that she is part Native American, but she passes for white. He wrote, being who you are may be tough, but hiding behind a lie, you're only hurting yourself. The question I asked was, what advice would you give to someone you didn't know? So here are the questions that I asked. And I've done this in my projects, but I've also done this in schools, where students pair up with someone in the room that they don't know and ask each other the questions as a way to have a conversation and to be real. I've done this with corporate executives. It's harder to say which group is more reluctant to be vulnerable, a corporate executive or a middle school student, maybe the corporate executive. So here's a slideshow of photographs of people holding chalkboards. And many of these photographs I did not take. These are students who took the photographs. Uh, let me, and here are the questions. And the last question is, how have you been affected by race? 
We'll play this with uh, music. We work with a lot of musicians, and this is Everybody Here is a Cloud by Cloud Cult. So we are now going to do a mini chalk talk. You have about four minutes. And here is a question to discuss with the person next to you. Talk about a situation that made you uncomfortable that you thought was based on race. What did you do about it? And after, at the end of four minutes, after you have this discussion, write on the chalkboard something that resulted, that you talked about in this conversation, something that reflects something about you. It could be one word, it could be a sentence, it could be a phrase, whatever it is that you want to write. Four minutes. Okay, yeah, start to think about uh, what to write on the chalkboard. Now this is a, a mic micro version of the chalk talk, but I, can, I, can, I, I feel like you could, you'd be, you could talk for quite a while. When, um, when I have middle school students do this, sometimes they find it very awkward. I said, how many people think this is going to be awkward to talk to with another student in the room you don't know? Almost everyone raises their hand. But why is it awkward? Well, because we don't know them. But why is it really awkward? When he gets down to it, it's because they're afraid of what other people are going to think of them. Same thing with corporate executives. But I feel that once people talk, then it gets easier. I asked the students afterwards what they thought this was like, and did it get any easier? Did it get any less awkward? Did it actually become fun? And most feel, feel that it did. So how many people have, have written something on chalkboard? Because now you're going to have your photograph taken, a big group photograph. OK. So who could uh, raise up your chalkboards, and we're going to take a big group photo. Okay. 
I, I wish we could read all the chalk for us. Just from what I can see, it's amazing. Um, the suggestion is that if you would like, leave them all at the, um, where? Leave them all in the back there, by the books. If you want to take it, take it. But if you want to leave them, just how about where you got your name picked? And we'll collate them. And then we'll put them all on Facebook. <laughs> How's that? All right, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Wing, for that really dynamic presentation. I know it's been provocative and interesting for all of us. In the spirit of his work, we're going, we are going to document it. We will be putting this on the Facebook. So thank you for sharing um, your messages and being part of the photo. And we encourage you, when you see it, um, forward it to other people and encourage them to, to think about this as well. Um, and we'd love to have you also tell them about the incredible, incredible ambassadors and their work. That'll be highlighted there, too, so you can pass that along. And we are really hopeful that all of you are already thinking about who you're going to nominate to receive this recognition next year. We'd really love to have that at our ninth annual Ambassador Award Program. With that, we are concluded. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>